Um, my name is Amy King with the Solano Resource Conservation District, and um, I'm here with my coworker um, Kevin Young Lai from the Resource Conservation District, and um, we are um, focusing today on on a question I get all the time from growers: on you know, I'm interested in a cover crop, but what do I use? What should I plant? So we have um, a couple of great speakers today. We're going to ask that you. Um, you hold your, your verbal questions until after each presentation is, is done. If you, if you want to enter it into the question and answer box um, on your Zoom screen there, that would be totally fine. And then um, Kevin and I will kind of look over them at the end of a presentation and, and the speakers can address them then, or you're welcome to um, uh, raise your hand at the end of a presentation if you have a question. Um, do I have any questions, let's see, from anybody else before we proceed? Ah, thanks, Kevin. All righty. I will then proceed. Hold on real quick. All righty. So our agenda today, um, I'll just do a, a quick introduction to the topic, which I think we did, and, a, and an overview of cover crops in general. So we are focusing on the, um, the notion of, of perennial cover crops and perennial systems, um, but we'll certainly be, be covering annual crops and um, annual cover crops as well. And I'll just kind of give a background um, on the questions folks tend to have about them and kind of general um, biology and physiology of cover crops and soil systems. And then we have um, Daniel Rath from UC Davis is gonna cover both perennial and annual cover crops and, and how it relates to water, which is also one of the most common questions um, <clears throat> that I know everybody struggles with um, when thinking about what to plant or if they should put in a cover crop and if it's going to um, uh, take water from their, from their primary crop. And then we have Kelly Boyer here from a Ballister Seed to talk about um, her thought process and how she helps people decide on um, a seed mix to put in. And then Kevin and I will um, go over some things that we can do to, to help you with some of these decision-making processes and um, services that we have available um, through our office um, and in partnership with the Solano County Water Agency to help growers um, improve their irrigation efficiency and, um, and kind of look at their system uh, as a whole and see where we could, we could make improvements or offer assistance. All righty. So, <clears throat> cover crop heebie-jeebies, <clears throat> which I have um, heard a lot of, and they are all completely legit. So these are the things I, I tend to hear um, from growers about kind of their hesitance to install something like a cover crop. So it's, a, it's an extra field operation, which translates directly into an expense um, to have to deal with a, basically a second cropping system. One more thing to manage. Um, it can prevent um, spring soil heating and exacerbate frost. So there's always a concern in, in things like vineyards because that uh, soil is no longer bare and warming up as much in the, the early spring. It can keep ground too wet in the spring when people are trying to get into uh, um, list beds and get ready for planting. Um, this one is of course in all these droughty years a major concern so that in, in the spring when the cover crop really starts taking off it, it, it is using water from the soil profile and, and the concern is that then that is not available to the crop they're trying to put in behind it. It can make harvest difficult. I know a lot of walnut growers are working on that. Um, it could maybe attract unwanted insects or pathogens. And, um, and this one I've heard, uh, heard a lot, particularly in clovers, um, at least anecdotally, that, that some cover crops attract rodents. So these are all completely legit <laughs> UEGBs, I think, to have about cover crops. But what we'll kind of um, talk about today is, is the, the other side, the reasons that um, they might be a, a good idea for your system. And I, so I kind of think of them as having kind of three suites of benefits to the soil, to the crop, your primary crop, and just to the ecosystem in general. And when it all comes down to it, what we really want to know is, you know, is this going to pencil out? And I, I think in a lot of cases it will. And I think perennial systems actually, of course, offer themselves, um, offer a, a good opportunity for, for cover crops to pencil out. So real quick, just kind of some of the soil benefits that we know um, exist for cover crops. And, and I know a lot of this is, is old hat um, to a lot of us, but basically anytime we've, we, we take a, a cropping system that's relatively um, homogeneous and introduce things like um, cover crops, whether we have two or three species in there or 10 or 15 species in there, 
we've increased the, the biodiversity of the, the subsurface, we've increased root species diversity, that's going to facilitate an increased soil microbial diverse community, which can then um, you know, leave the, the soil system in general more agile for, for soil mining, things like micronutrients that in, in turn will help our, our crop. Um, cover crops certainly increase soil organic matter over time. Um, this might be, some, this is you know, something that is a, a very direct benefit of cover crops. It can definitely reduce erosion and, and soil loss, particularly in kind of flood prone areas. And they increase water infiltration, um, reduce runoff. And there's quite a lot of work um, going on right now, including in, in Solano County on, on the use of cover crops to just improve groundwater recharge. Um, I thought this was really interesting and it's, it's just kind of a mess, but I, I wanted just to show some data. We can just kind of briefly look over it. The take home here, um, I thought this was a, a really great um, synthesis paper where they took a whole bunch of different studies and the numbers here aren't important. What's interesting is the x-axis there is percent change in various soil health indicators. And so if it, then it goes to the left and gets negative, it was a decrease in a cover crop system. And if it went um, to the right, it was an increase. And a bunch of the stuff that we kind of care about when we think about our soils, a lot of these um, nutrients and soil organic carbon tended to increase, things like weeds, diseases, pests, not that surprisingly stayed about the same because we're introducing other plants there as well. Um, this was just kind of a nice review of, you know, there's a lot of literature about what, what cover crops can do for you. And it's, it's just kind of a nice overview of the, the benefits of them to your soil system. I did want to point out an interesting one here at the bottom. They looked at greenhouse gas emissions, um, which um, certainly in the, in the presence of another growing plant can go up, but we'll talk a little bit about that later and why um, overall cover crops and really just any growing green plant is long-term a pretty good way to, to sequester carbon in the system. So direct crop benefits um, can, be, can be many. Um, there's quite a bit of work done in, in how cover crops can attract beneficial insects to your system. They can increase nutrient availability, which we, we touched on before. Um, this one I think is a, is a really notable one in some systems, particularly vineyards, because the, the alleys that are cover cropped um, tend to be so exposed in the summer. Um, Having, having green growing perennial vegetation in those alleys can really reduce summer soil temperatures in these hot climates. Um, a nice stand of cover crops can really choke out your weeds. Um, there are quite a few systems, especially in sort of heavier soils and higher water tables where a deeply rooted cover crop, cover crop can, can be a hydraulic lift, actually move soil moisture higher into the profile, making it available for your crop. And they can provide um, a livestock feed. <clears throat> this little this little sheep is wishing there was a big cover crop there to eat. He's just just getting um, um, And this, I just wanted to present one other little thing of data. This was also another really nice review paper um, that focused on phosphorus, um, kind of a, a notoriously difficult um, and difficult to get and vital um, plant nutrient that is greatly facilitated um, in the presence of cover crops. So this was, if you ever want to look it up, this is a great review of, of the different ways in which cover crops can help make phosphorus more available to your cropping system. So both via the cover crop residue falling and decomposing on the, on the soil surface and then microbially mediated phosphorus uptake into your main crop, uh, um, but the just also subsurface in the, those cover crop roots um, can create more mycorrhizae um, that can mine the soil for phosphorus both inorganic and organic pea are, are more available in a cover crop system. And then benefits to the overall system, <clears throat> um, there's lots. So as I mentioned, any sort of anything growing green and taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into plant material and down into their roots is gonna increase carbon sequestration. Um, it's, there's always rumors, but I think it's becoming more and more likely that eventually there will be some sort of carbon market in California um, for growers to participate in. Cover crops can provide great wildlife habitat and pollinator services for bees and butterflies and all the other pollinators. And certainly increase groundwater recharge, um, particularly in Solano County, this is actually really actively being looked at. We have quite a few um, areas with fairly high groundwater. It doesn't take too much extra oomph to get more water down in there if we've got a good root system for the water to follow. Um, and they can also be attractive. This is certainly a, um, notable in vineyards. 
where cover crops can be a, a really beautiful part of the vineyard system. And so I just wanted to mention one of the one of the reasons that we are that we're here today and that we've been working on this stuff and um, is that we have a, a demonstration site um, for a variety of practices, but cover crops is one of them in Sassoon Valley. <clears throat> this is the Wild Oak Vineyard, and um, it's on a real visible road. So it's at Ledgewood Road at Mancus Corner in Sassoon Valley. If you ever wanted to drive by our hedge out there, it's looking really good. So these landowners were interested in kind of the whole shebang. They wanted to increase wildlife habitat. Um, they wanted to beautify. And they wanted to um, just do something with the, those edges and margins of, of their ag area that there isn't that much else to do with. So they figured we might as well put a bunch of native plants and, and beautiful plants in there. Um, so we did, we just installed the riparian habitat. There's a perennial cover crop in the vineyard alleys and a, and a hedgerow of native plants that goes all the way around the, the vineyard. Um, and at that vineyard, and how we got to know um, Kelly Boyer from Labalister Seed, is that the, the landowners worked with Labalisters to come up with a really diverse cover crop mix. It was really interesting to see it go in and come up. Um, <clears throat> and this is the mix they came up with. And then because they love lupins and they love bees and butterflies and they're such great um, insectary plants, they added lupins to that um, insectary mix. So what they did there was take two um, prefab mixes at the balusters, the vineyard special and the insectary mix, and then added lupins. <clears throat> and at first, I, I have to admit, I was a, I was a skeptic of this, of this many species going into one cover crop mix. <clears throat> I just always worry that none of them will do, you know, none of them will shine. If there's this many, they'll, I always worry that they'll kind of drown each other out. But, um, but I'm a total convert now to a whole bunch of, of different species going in. Um, this, this site has actually lovely soil. Everybody did pretty good and the cover crop was, was absolutely beautiful um, last year. It did really great. Um, and I just real quick wanted to touch on, there are um, lots, you know, so the, the question we get the most often, honestly, is that if I'm walking around with someone thinking about installing a cover crop is, which one should I use? <clears throat> and there are lots of different tools around to kind of help you with that decision. I'm just gonna point out a few of them. Um, some of my favorites, this is through the UC Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, or SARE. They have a cover crop database and it is not exhaustive. It doesn't have all of them, but it has all the ones that are the most common. And just kind of, you can, you can query it or you can look up um, species by species and it just kind of has the quick at a glance um, things you can expect about all the different species. <clears throat> and then more recently, I thought this was, this was cool. So UC Cooperative Extension in Contra Costa County partnered with the Contra Costa RCD and did this whole series of, um, of short courses, basically, on, um, on everything you'd ever wanna know about, about cover crops. And there's a bunch of them and there's links there and they're just on YouTube and they're, they're super cool. It's a really actually a great resource um, if you've got um, particular questions about cover crops. But I, I did also wanna say that hands down, I have always found the most helpful thing is to just get yourself a good seed rep. The, um, the seed companies and folks who work in this all the time have, are generally fantastic at looking at a site and recommending exactly what would work for your particular site. Um, and that is it. If anybody has any questions, Kevin, do you mind unmuting the um, participants if they did have any questions or things could go into the um, Q&A? Mine was just the background, that's not super exciting. And if anybody, nobody does have questions, I will stop sharing. And um, Daniel, you could share your screen. Sounds good. I'll give it a minute. Okay. Um, well, I'll I'll just go ahead and, and let me turn my video on. It's always nicer, I think. Oh, there we go. Um, sure. So I'll just go ahead and talk a little bit about cover crops and water movement. So, um, hi everybody. My name is Daniel Rath. I'm a graduate student in the UC Davis Soil and Biogeochemistry Department. I work with Dr. Kate Scow. I'm primarily a soil microbiologist, but I do a lot of work at Russell Ranch, which is a long-term experimental station right outside of Davis, and I've done a lot of work on cover crops and water movements. Uh, water movement is sort of part of my thesis, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, just make sure. 
There we go. So Amy gave a really good overview of you know, what a cover crop is. I'm sure this is not anything surprising to anyone. Um, there are a host of different benefits. Uh, I particularly liked how you divided those into like three different areas. Uh, the NRCS has a really good uh, graphic that kind of sums up um, some of the most common benefits of cover crops. I'm going to use the abbreviation CC to refer to cover crops throughout the presentation, just as a, uh, to orient you, uh, just so that I can save a little bit more space. It would take a very long presentation to kind of cover all of these things. What I'm going to focus on is just this one particular benefit. And the wording is very important. So how exactly cover crops increase infiltration of water? I'm going to dig in a little bit on that. And this uh, applies to both annual and perennial cover crops. So if you know you take an example of a bed that's been left fallow for the winter and the blue cracks in there are these microscopic spaces in between soil particles uh, called the soil pore network. And so that soil pore network is where the water lives in the soil, basically. It is not just a place where the water is stored, but it is also a road. It's a pathway that allows water to move from the soil surface deeper into the soil. Because I'm a microbiologist, uh, I'd have to tell you that this is also where all of the microbes in the soil live. They, can't, they have to live in the open spaces. They can't really fit um, where the soil particles are. And so this is where these are hot spots for a lot of the microbial transformations and other good things that we associate with the microbial community. Now, if you add a cover crop to this mix, if you add basically any plant, the plant roots will tap into that network. They will plug in. The objective is to get access to the water and dissolve nutrients that are held inside that network. As those roots grow, they're going to push aside soil particles and basically create space for themselves. And because roots are constantly growing and dying back, even over the course of one season, you can have up to 20% of the roots from a plant die back. That ends up uh, creating a much more complex and interconnected soil pore network that also includes a lot of links to the soil surface. This is super important when it comes to rainfall because that is more roads, more pathways for water to move down into the soil. If you have a soil pore network with that is less interconnected, that's less connections to the surface, there's not going to be as much chance for that water to move into the soil profile and so be kept there. And so it's going to move laterally. It's going to seek out sort of the lowest point in the field and it's going to carry all of the soil on top, which is the soil that has most of the organic matter and all of the good things that we would ideally like to keep there for the crop. Uh, so cover crops also increase soil organic matter. And in this particular context, organic matter is like a sponge. It's a lot easier for water to move through organic matter than it is to the, for the water to move through these dense soil particles. It's sort of the difference between pouring water on a sponge and pouring water on a brick. Because cover crop residues increase organic matter um, and the cover crop roots themselves provide that physical action of creating pores, basically cover crops you know, increase the uh, infiltration of water into the soil from two different angles. Uh, one of the really good things about this increase in the poor connectivity and the poor network is that as water is moving down deeper into the soil, it can carry things with it. And so whatever sort of dissolved nutrients are present on that plot, um, we can find it deeper in the soil profile. This is part of the research that we've conducted at Russell Ranch, but basically we found that plots that had both compost and a cover crop had a lot more organic carbon deeper in the soil profile. Compost contains a lot of dissolved organic nutrients. If you've ever poured water on compost and seen how black or brown it is when it comes off, that's basically those dissolved organic nutrients moving along with that water. In the context of a field, the, those dissolved organic nutrients will move deeper. And because deeper in the soil profile, there are many like fewer microbes, that carbon is more likely to be down there for a longer period of time. 
So that's one of the reasons that uh, we believe we were able to see about 20 tons per hectare higher organic carbon in our system that had both compost and cover crops over 25 years is that that carbon was transported deeper into the soil profile, moved out of the zone that microbes could break it down. And that's directly due to the infiltration provided by cover crop roots. So you might have noticed when I talked about the soil pore network, it, I didn't just talk about infiltration, it's also a place where water is stored. And so it strikes me as interesting that on this graph of potential cover crop benefits, there's not a little circle saying, oh, well, cover crops increase soil water storage. This is a topic that has been under a lot of debate. And I know from a lot of the people, a lot of the farmers that I have talked to, one of the main concerns is that cover crops may reduce the amount of water stored in the soil for the crop coming after. And so we're going to dig a little bit in on that and I talk about why that may be and then look at a couple papers that have come out recently that are trying to really dig in on this topic. So if we take our original fallow plot that has the poor network, there's water stored in there, there are basically two directions of water can be lost from this plot. Um, they can go, uh, water can go up through evaporation. So uh, Amy highlighted that the, um, you know, one of the benefits of cover crops is that it keeps the soil surface cooler. If the soil surface is bare, is open to the sun, energy from the sun hits the surface, it heats it up. Those little microscopic pores um, can get quite hot. And so the water evaporates, turns into water vapor and is lost to the atmosphere. So the water can go up or it can go down. So because the pore network is interconnected and moves deeper into the soil, that water can kind of infiltrate a lot deeper. Um, and that still counts as water being lost because if the water moves out of the rooting zone of your crop, then it might as well not be accessible. You either have to plant something deeper rooted to get access to that water, or you have to wait until it hits the groundwater and then use energy to pump it back up. And so that's just in a fallow plot, a plot that does not have a cover crop. If you introduce a cover crop, what you are basically doing is providing another road for water to be lost. And that is true transpiration. So plants breathe in much the same way we do. Every breath that we take, we lose a fair amount of um, water. So if you're, that's one of the reasons that if you're in a desert, uh, you get dehydrated very quickly because what, the air is very dry. Um, and those poor networks created by the roots can also allow water to percolate, to infiltrate a little bit better. And so there's a potent, there's greater potential for that water to move out of the rooting zone. There is a decrease in evaporation, however, because again, as Amy said, cover crop canopies will shade the soil surface. There's less energy from sunlight hitting that soil surface. Temperatures don't go up as much, and so there's less evaporation. Now, this is sort of the theoretical way that it works, but in a practical sense, there's not a lot of data talking about how big these arrows are. There is the potential for more water to be lost, but does that actually translate into more water being lost from the soil? And does that affect storage? And so one of the main things that we want to try and get at, you know, we know that cover crops will increase infiltration. We know that cover crops increase the potential for water to be stored in the soil. What is not clear is whether cover crops increase water loss to the point that it offsets those storage increases. And so, you know, which one causes more water loss? Is it evaporation without a cover crop or is it evaporation and transpiration, which we, you know, slam those words together, you get evapotranspiration as a mouthful uh, with a cover crop. Well, um, because, you know, I dug back um, for this paper that we did and looking at the, you know, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Jeff Mitchell's work, but the, he's one of the researchers who has done a lot on, in this area and a lot of the papers that I think uh, lie that base, underlie that basis for like, there is water loss under a cover crop comes from his group. And so this is one that was published in 2015, and they found that annual cover crops uh, depleted about, you know, between 0.5 to 2 inches of water in 2013 and 2014. Um, I put the 
location in there as well, because I believe that these results are quite location dependent. But you know, you might notice that 0.5 to 2 inches of water is quite a large range, but that's also sort of a significant amount of water that could have been left in the soil for the crop coming after. Uh, Jeff Mitchell also has a couple of graduate students at Davis or graduate students have worked with him at Davis. And there's a recent um, research article published just this year that they looked, they, they were like, let's look at this phenomenon sort of on a wider scale. We're going to look at it across California. And so they measured the evapotranspiration from these different plots and they took a really detailed look at water storage and they found that aggregated across California, there was no significant impact on soil water storage from cover crops. These, uh, there's, <laughs> this is one of the exciting things about research is that again, you know, the same people worked on these two plots and you see these different trends from year to year. And so it can be hard to understand, you know, well, what exactly is the mechanism underlying it? So I think it's better to take a little bit closer look at this paper, the recent one that was published uh, these are the research sites that they did is sort of spread out throughout the San Joaquin Valley. They only looked at evapotranspiration in two locations, which is Davis at the Russell Ranch experiment and down at the five point experiment sort of near Fresno. And, you know, when we, at, we had this question, is more water lost due to evapotranspiration from a cover crop? They found that three millimeters more of water was lost from due to evapotranspiration over the entire winter in Davis and 18 millimeters in Fresno. To give you context for how big these numbers are, a single irrigation event that's about one is, you know, it's about one inch of water during the summer, and that's about 25 millimeters of water, which means that the total amount of water lost due to cover crops over the entire winter was less than a single irrigation event during the summer. So the takeaway they did here is that, yes, evapotranspiration does cause more water loss, but it is not a lot. And those uh, that loss of water is potentially offset by the increases in infiltration and storage. When they looked at the difference in water storage between these two plots, they found that it really wasn't different. Um, and this, again, may be tied to the fact that any potential increase in storage may be balanced out by that small increase in loss. So their conclusion was that it really does not have super strong effects on soil water storage, whether that they, and you know, this is, this is looking at both annual and perennial cover crops. Uh, this is also, there's a paper that literally, I think was released um, about four days, a week ago. Uh, that looks at modeling, uh, say again, it's Jeffrey Mitchell, it's a team of UC Davis from UC Merced that are looking, they use both models and like measured data and they found much the exact same thing, that cover crops do not have very large effects on soil water storage uh, or soil water loss, but they do have significant increases in infiltration, which because you don't have a significant effect, that's probably why increased soil water storage is not commonly touted as one of the benefits of cover crops, even though there is the potential for it. So why is it so hard to find a clear answer? If you look at the results from five points and you look at the results sort of average across all of California, uh, there's a lot of focus on how soil measurements these days need to be very region specific. And so, you know, we at Russell Ranch ha have also looked at water, move, uh, water storage and cover crops, and we see significant results, but they are different from what is reported in the literature. And so this is likely because there's a lot of factors that influence how, whether water is going to be stored or lost under a cover crop, and that includes rainfall, that includes termination date, that includes soil type, and that includes the cover crop use, because, you know, cover crops are not a monolithic entity. You, they are very diverse and, you know, one type of cover crop can have a very significant impact uh, against another type. And I'm sure that we're going to get into that in the later presentations as well. It's probably better for a seed producer to expound on how much different those different types are. But one thing we have found is that in a wet year, um, inputs may be higher than losses. So if you have a lot of rain coming in, that potential for increased infiltration 
might mean that more water is stored under a cover crop and that balances out any minor potential losses that you would get. Uh, looking at our results from Russell Ranch, we saw these are, this is a graph of water stored in a couple different systems. The light gray line at the bottom is a plot with no cover crop. And the two lines at the top are plots that have cover crops and cover crop plus compost. And we basically saw at all points during this winter, which was fairly wet for us, about 10% more water stored in the plots with cover crops. And so this is, an, this is a finding that has been echoed in these various papers. If it's a wet year, your cover crops will help store more water because those potential losses are offset by just a larger amount coming in. Another really important factor, at least when it comes to annual cover crops, is when it's terminated. And so if you're thinking about the benefits of cover crops, the benefits uh, to water storage and infiltration and organic matter can be offset if they force you to delay planting. Um, and that's a major issue. If those annual cover crops are left on the field for a long period of time, you, more evapotranspiration will occur, there's potential for more water loss, planting is delayed, and so that can be sort of a negative impact. So in summary, we can be pretty sure that cover crops increase infiltration, and that's via creating root channels, increasing the complexity of this pore network, and increasing organic matter content. Cover crops do cause some water loss through evapotranspiration, but this loss does not appear to be very large. And because of that, the cover crop impact on water storage appears to be minimal um, and very dependent on factors like rainfall or whether you have a very clay or a very sandy soil. And I think one thing that is telling is that in all of these papers, they sort of end by saying that the potential for soil water loss for cover crops really does not appear to offset all the potential benefits that you get from organic matter, from infiltration, and potential benefits to the soil microbial community. Uh, and I think that that's that. So if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to fire away. Hey, Daniel, I've got, I've got one, maybe just um, food for thought, and I'd be curious about Kelly's take on this too, but but so in perennial systems where we tend to work a lot, because there's just so many orchards and vineyards and such in, in Solano County, um, I have this notion that a, you know, kind of not too high in the profile, low growing perennial cover crop would, once established, create that nice boundary layer that prevents evaporation from the soil surface. I have this notion that, that it won't be overly competitive for water, particularly with a deeply rooted perennial like walnuts or, or almonds or, or grapes. Do you have any thoughts about that? You know, some of the annuals get, you know, three feet tall, they're huge. They put on so much biomass every year. And so particularly right in an annual cropping system, I, I can really see why it see, feels like they dry out the soil profile right before people are trying to plant. But um, do you have any thoughts about, or did you in, in cruising the literature see anything specific to, to perennial cover crops and perennial systems? Yeah, um, so in that paper um, that had the map, basically they looked at, um, cover crops in both orchards and uh, and in like farming fields. And they looked at a mixture of like grasses and annual cover crops. And basically what they found was that again, it was quite site dependent. So the Northern California sites had sort of an increase in soil moisture um, over the year. And in the Southern California sites, there was a decrease. And because they measured all of California, those canceled each other out. And they were like, well, it's hard to say that there's a real significant impact. But that's probably really dependent on the type of soil and the type of climate, just because I think Northern California gets a bit more water than Southern California. And so again, it's a, it's a game of like, is the input greater than the potential output? And you have, yeah, it gives you the potential to respond to that greater input. Um, but I don't know if Kelly has a more sort of nuanced idea. <laughs> well, I not so much in terms of that specific question. I, mm -hmm. I um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know that I can add for, to that question, yeah. Yeah, uh, 
I, I do the they did see that evaporation was sort of like one of the biggest drivers of water loss, I think was one of the results from that paper was that, you know, a, evaporation was like a huge part of it. And then transpiration was like a little piece on mm -hmm. top. And so, you know, the it is yeah, it's potentially your act, you know, if you have a deep rooted cover crop in a perennial mm -hmm. system or perennial cover crop, you're accessing more of water, but there's a really good potential for those losses to be offset by the decrease in evaporation because the soil is covered. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Kelly, I will um share your slides. Does that show up okay? Uh, yeah. So you let's see. Can I control it or you control it? Mm -hmm. You control it. I control it. But you can okay. point at me or say go or next. Or <laughs> okay. All right. So um, we had a little bit of technical difficulty, and I'm sure it was completely 100% my fault. Um, so anyway, Amy is going to uh, do our do my slides for me. But um, so basically, I'm going to concentrate on benefits of cover crops and how do you choose which which seed species do you choose and which combination of seed species do you choose so um we'll just go to the next slide the first thing know your priority so there was a lot of options and a lot of benefits to cover crops some of them can be achieved by certain types of cover crops Others are achieved by different ones. Sometimes they're a juxtaposition to each other. So it is going to be important for you to sort of know what's most important in deciding what to choose. So is it moisture? Is it organic matter? Is it nutrients? Is it attracting beneficials? Um, there may be ways to address a lot of those different ones, sometimes not all in one single cover crop. Um, so example, we'll go to the next slide. We talked about in the insectary blend, and this does tend to be a more expensive type of cover crop to install. They're really small seed, tends to be flowers and clovers. The plants themselves can be annuals and perennials. A lot of, uh, when we talk about a perennial cover crop blend, we may be talking about annual actual plants, but that they reseed well and that is so they, they live on perennially by reseeding each other. So just not to confuse that a little bit, but um, insectary blends are very popular. They, you might want this and you might want some other aspect of cover crops. Sometimes people will put insectary blends in every fifth row or every 10th row, or maybe you have an area surrounding along a fence line or turnarounds or some areas where you can put it where you can just leave it alone. It can accomplish its benefit without necessarily being in the crop row. So that's a one thought to do with insectary type blends. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Um, I did mention, I thought I'd mention brassicas. Um, those are more for nematode suppression. And Amy mentioned the visual appeal. And that certainly is the reason a lot of people plant mustards. So it's a similar size. It tends to be a less expensive type of seed, um, usually very available, um, usually fairly easy to manage. It's an early uh, maturing, although if frost is an issue, it, as you can see in this photo, they can be fairly tall and that is a concern. Um, Mustards can be mixed with some of the other more traditional annual cover crops, um, peas and beans and vetches. So a lot of times we'll see those go together. It won't have the appearance that this one is. This is a pretty solid stand of mustard. But um, anyway, I thought I'd mention that. All right. So if your primary goal are, is nitrogen uh, or uh, soil nutrient improvement, you're going to find the most benefit from things like the fixed nitrogen, legumes, peas, beans, vetches are the main ones. Some people will use clovers and clovers are lend themselves better to be incorporated into um, perennial cover crop 
mixes, that they will reseed well and persist. They don't tend to get as tall. Um, and they do definitely contribute nitrogen and other nutrient, just not to quite the same level as the other ones do. So we'll go to the next one. Um, if your primary concern is reducing soil temps and weed suppression, then having a cover crop that stays there is obviously more beneficial. Some of the most common things we use, we see uh, Blondo brome grass and Zorro annual fescue, those we see used a lot. Um, those are both annual grasses, but receive themselves very well. So we'll continue for, for many years, um, as long as they're allowed to go to seed. We do have some people use native grasses. It tends to be an investment up front, um, but the people who have invested in that have them years later. Gallo I, has had their native grass mix. Um, it's a blend of three native fescues. They've probably had it for 15 years now. So it was a big upfront, but um, you know, that's, it's advantage, advantageous that way. There are some non-native perennial plants that can be used. We see fine fescues. I don't know that those would do well over in Solano County. Um, they do better in more coastal. They do tend to use water all year round. So probably not very useful in your area. Um, most of the clovers are used are annuals. So they, they don't compete so much with, the annuals don't compete so much with water. They die at, when things heat up. Um, and then create a stubble or mulch, um, but then are not competing for water. So we'll go to the next one. If your primary is uh, soil tilt, organic matter, soil uh, water retention, then you know cereals are by far and away your best bet in terms of actual just tonnage of what you'll get of organic matter. So the primary ones we see in our area are barley and oats are the most. Um, after that, we do see some wheat. Triticale is pretty popular. I would say actually triticale is probably the third most popular. Um, and cereal rye grain are um, the primary cereals. Now those can be combined very well with things like peas and beans and vetches. Those are tend to be tilled under in the spring. I want to just before we go to the next slide, I want to make a note of that barley that you see there at UC 937 barley and the beard that is on. You see those little awns on the seed versus the forerunner, which is a triticale. Um, they're very small awns on it, but not very noticeable. Because as we go to our next slide, that's one of the things, if you are thinking about animal feed, you wanna make sure that you use um, beardless type of cereals. Um, usually animal feed is a secondary type of concern, um, but if you're going to try and do it, there's just a couple of things that you wanna make sure and notate. Um, and then the other thing is you just have to be careful about legumes. Legumes are high in protein, and if you put animals on it suddenly, you can cause problems for the animals. So um, th those are the primary things. Mostly they'll eat most anything, but if you're really trying to feed them, you um, wanna make sure and, and not harm them in the process. So um, one other thing I would just wanted to notate is if you are an organic grower, make sure and let your seed supplier know as you're making those discussions. Um, there are certainly, there's just some parameters that we can, knowing that up front, we can guide you and whether there's organic seed availability. And then there's certain things that you're just not, some seed treatments, primarily along the clovers. Some are approved for organic use and some are not, and just don't want you to get caught using the wrong thing after the fact. So that doesn't, uh, doesn't go well, but we can help guide you up front. So um, just a couple other notes I made as we were going through some of the other things. Um, one of the objections to cover crops is making it too wet. It, 
um, the soil moisture too wet when you're trying to get in there. Um, it can, one of the things, if you have a particularly wet spot, cover crops can actually help you dry it out. So if we can sort of tailor things to certain spe specific sites, if that's a concern. So I thought I'd just notate that. Um, and then also harvest difficulty. Now with the nut crops, this is kind of a different issue. So, but with grapes in particular, one of the difficulties that comes up is sometimes people will want to wait until the harvest is done before they do their seeding. I just wanna say more and more growers are putting in their cover crops before harvest and it's fine. It, it just, it will just sit there until, um, until it rains. And so don't let that be a barrier to, oh, it got too late. Oh, it rained and now I can't get in there. Um, if you have a lull between varietals and harvest, go back in or as you're finishing up, you can go back in, but you can all, you can seed before harvest. So um, that was kind of a, in a nutshell what I had addressed. So take, be happy to take any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. And we will um, we'll send out to all the participants and attendees a link to this recording and we'll send um, the balusters in both as well, if that's okay with you. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Have, have a yeah. follow up. Um, anybody, I, we did have a couple people join um, right as you started talking. If anybody has any questions, you're welcome to put them into the Q&A. Um, raise your hand. Or I, I will you mention that in terms of our services, our seed services, in addition to consultation, uh, most of that, well, really, virtually all of it happens over the phone or preferably on the phone very, via email. Doing it over email is kind of tedious. But um, <laughs> um, but the other thing we do is, you know, we're a local family business. We have three mixers here on site. And so we'll uh, mix seed to people's specific uh, desires. Um, I've highlighted some of the more common things, um, but we 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 do we we mix up whatever someone wants us to mix for them. Um, so, I have one other question: other, Do you have yeah. do you have too many people ever request a, like perennial native grass? You mentioned a uh, gallo, and I, I think just a little bit of that in vineyards over the. Many yeah, years. I'm just curious yeah. There, there was a point when that was more popular. I think mm -hmm. the expense of it yeah. is a Done. stopping Very point. Expensive. It's, it's expensive. Um, and so small scale vineyard mm -hmm. owners will do it. Um, the, I mentioned the fine fescue blend. That has been kind of the alternative to the native blend that I've seen a lot of growers in Sonoma and Napa go to we, we've nice. sold a lot of that um i just don't know i just don't know that it works well in solano county though yeah yeah no that makes sense and the native yeah, um, yeah the native grass yeah. has gotten very expensive yeah. yeah yeah all right well i will stop that presentation and if nobody has any other questions kevin i turn it over to you Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Lai. I am the Adwater, um, well, I'm kind of the Solano, R I work with Solano RCD here. And we, today I'm going to be talking to you guys about our Adwater Efficiency Program itself. Um, so, uh, currently, the Solano RCD is working with the Solano County Water Agency and uh, Solano Irrigation District on this program to offer various services for free to landowners and growers. Um, the certain type of services that we offer is um, IR sensing of uh, irrigated fields to determine distribution uniformity or help identify breaks and leaks. Uh, general irrigation efficiency plans, uh, assistance with monitoring equipment, weather such as like weather stations, white moisture sensors, um, and et cetera. Um, 
We also do planning on assistance for new improved on arm practices such as carver crops, uh, conversion of your irrigation system to drip, uh, creating wildlife habitat, um, we do offer pump efficiency tests, which we do contract out with the contractor um, and certification of irrigation uh, and nitrogen management plans for the irrigated lands program. Um, so to talk about one a little bit more into one of the things that we actually do um, is using drones for ag water efficiency and just to give you a little brief background on drones, there's many different types of platforms for drones. Uh, the two most common type of platforms is, as shown here is motocopter rotors or and fixed wings. We prefer the motocopter rotors just because they're easier to man manually control and to position and to obtain the correct shots that we need to get. Um, these are some of the different types of payloads that a drone can carry. Um, the primary three payloads that are most definitely beneficial to agriculture is um, the RGB, multispectral, and the thermal. Uh, the RGB is pretty much similar to a camera on your phone, but can provide a full in-depth detailed photos from an aerial point of view of your area. Uh, the multispectral uh, payloads are able to take pictures in a different wavelength, such as uh, green, red, red edge, and near uh, infrared, producing what's called a normalized difference vegetation index, or uh, NDVI images. And so what these NDVI images can be do is that they can be processed and used to evaluate soil productivity and analyzing plant health by detecting very subtle uh, variations in the plants before any visible symptoms can appear. And this can in turn infer like yield distributions overall. Um, due to staff time, we're actually more focused in water efficiencies uh, using our thermal payloads. Uh, however, there are certainly contractors out there that can provide plant health data. Uh, and so, as you can see on this next slide, um, this is a free service we're, we're providing to growers and landowners using a thermal payload on a drone. In this case, um, a, this is was done by a Matrice uh, 300 RTK. Um, and we were doing it for a landowner to provide distribution of a uh, uniformity aspect. Um, and as you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen, um, there are two photos taken in RGB and infrared. And we were able to stitch these images together and analyze the distribution uniformity within the field overall. Um, and any point out any other problematic areas uh, where the plants were not getting enough water or they were getting too much water overall. Um, as uh, Daniel had mentioned earlier with the cover crops, um, the orange and um, orange spots on the, the images show actually a hotter area because they were actually bare soil. Um, while the darker purple is actually showing um, more of the uh, water being held into the soil, resulting in a cooler temperature. Um, another uh, thing that we can do to offer assistance is technical assistance for planning on on-farm practices. Um, so we can brainstorm with you about irrigation issues, improvements and efficiency tests, uh, carbon farming planning, preventing soil erosion, uh, applying for financial assistance to programs to help implement your ideas through NRCS, uh, CDFA Healthy Soils Program, or any other state and federal funds. Um, and these uh, financial assistance programs can be used to help uh, do cover crops, hedgerows, windbreaks, wildlife habitats, and pollinator projects.
Our third offered services, which is the pump efficiency test, as most of you guys all know, um, the pump efficiency test measures the various aspects of the pump's operations and provides an overall estimation of the efficiency of the pump and the cost of running it under that test condition. We're currently, as I said before, we're currently contracting out to provide pump efficiency tests to landowners. Um, but the reason why a pump should be test should be done is that it can identify problems before a breakdown occurs or energy bills climb and increase, definitely increase water efficiency. And pumps should be often be tested about one to three years, depending on the annual usage and severity of the operating conditions. While if you do happen to have a booster pump being supplied with clean water, those should be tested every two to three years. And you can use that data from the original uh, pump test and the uh, current pump test to compare the performance curve and it'll show if a pump adjustment is needed or a pair is actually needed. And you can uh, obtain a pump test by contacting me and we can set it up uh, an actual time and date uh, to have the contractor come out and talk with you and conduct a pump test. Um, little off, side off from the ag water efficiency, but uh, we do also offer a pesticide disposal program. And we are doing this in coordination with our partners over at the Solana County uh, Resource Management, the Solana County Commissioner's Office, Dixon Resource Conservation District, and Cal Recycle. And what we're doing here is we're offering free disposal of any legacy pesticides slash herbicides um, and we'll currently work with you individually for the disposal of such hazardous waste. It's a first come first serve basis. And we'll also likely host uh, a pesticide disposal event in the spring. Um, in order to sign up for this pesticide disposal program, we'll need to know, uh, you'll need to send over your name uh, contact info, which is basically your phone number and email address, and a list of legacy pesticides you would like to have disposed of. Um, and that list will need to include the pesticide slash herbicide name. If it if the label's not there, it's okay to write unknown to us. Um, an estimation on the quantity of the legacy pesticides the size of the container it is in and the type of container. So if it's like a metal container, plastic or glass container. And yeah, I'll uh, open it up to any questions if anyone else has any questions. It's a funny picture. I have a quick, just a quick follow up, Kevin. So if, if they, mm -hmm. if people have something just sitting around in their garage or some, you know, a barn that they inherited that is absolutely unlabeled, and not known, we can still help people deal with that. Yeah, we can have the has, Absolutely. has waste people come out and deal with it. Yes, um, so if it's unknown and um, it's in large quantities, we can certainly bring out our hazardous waste contractor to come out and uh, uh, one, test it, and two, haul it away as well. So. Yeah. And then I had one, and one other question on the on the infrared slide. On the infrared slide, yeah. that um, that field was pretty darn pretty darn uniform. Was that an orchard? That was, was a tomato field, actually. It was tomatoes. That's right. Well, so if yes. but if he had had like if there had been um, a leak, or if it was you know buried drip in tomatoes and there was a wetter spot, it would have shown up as like super super dark purple extra cool. absolutely yeah is that how the yes. ir works to find a irrigation inefficiency okay. mm -hmm. it will show up yeah if there was a uh really big leak there you will be able to determine and show up as a really dark purple spot or if water wasn't actually getting to right. a certain area of the field it'll show up as a, a, a higher a temperature so in the, also in the orange yeah, coloration. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. Well, Kevin's got his contact info there, and that is a good way to reach any of us at the RCD. If anybody has any um, 
follow-up questions or interest in those programs, you're welcome to contact any of us from the RCD.